Good morning. It is the Lord's Day. It's June 18th of 2023 and it's Father's Day. And may all the fathers out there have a wonderful day. Today my message is called Jesus More Than You Know, taken from Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, through whom he inher appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power, after making purification for sins, he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. The book of Hebrews was written to the first century Hebrew Christians, and there were quite a few of them. The key word to the book is the word better. And I'd encourage you to read the book of Hebrews, maybe a chapter a day or read it in one sitting. But when you do, take a highlighter or a marker and every time you see the word better, underline it. The book of Hebrews ties the Old Testament rituals of the temple and explains them in the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the themes, of course, is better. And we will learn that Christ is better than the angels. He is a better high priest, <clears throat> a better sacrifice, and he has a better covenant. <clears throat> so let's start first in our text with the message. God spoke. And that's a miracle. Some people, uh, in like many of the founders of our nation, were deists. And Deus believed that God created the world, and then after creating the world, he took off and abandoned it. No, God spoke. And he spoke many times. Many times God spoke. And we can think of how God spoke with Adam and Eve and Abraham and David and all these characters. And it says he spoke in many ways. He spoke to Moses in a burning bush. He spoke to Abraham <clears throat> by bringing angels to him. He even spoke to Balaam through the mouth of a donkey. Yes, God spoke many times in many ways, and mostly he spoke through the prophets. The Old Testament prophets, God spoke to them, and in, with the power of the Holy Spirit, he gave them and inspired them, giving them the ability to write his word for us. And he gave prophecies about how we should live, prophecies about the nature of God, and prophecies about the future. But in these last days, and when we think of the last days, let's think first century, <clears throat> he spoke through his son. And what God is saying to us is that Jesus is the message of God for us. And it's true. And the Old Testament talked about Jesus. The Gospels are all about Jesus. The books of the epistles are all about Jesus. And finally, the book of Revelation, and many of us forget this, but the official name of it is the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And God is saying in the last days, my message is Jesus. Now, the second thing about this better son of God, more than you know Jesus, is majesty. The scripture says he was appointed heir of all things. Being an heir is an awesome thing, but one of the unique things about being an heir is that usually property and wealth does not transfer until death. And I remember when I had wealthy parents and didn't have two nickels to put together. And it didn't make any difference if I was an heir because I didn't have any of the money. And my mother and father were not about to part with any of it until they were done. 
And this is unique for Jesus because God has no beginning and he has no end. He never dies. So how does Jesus inherit these things? Well, number one, they have a father and son partnership. And I have watched many father-son partnerships. Some of them work and some of them don't. But the ones that work really good are where the son is very obedient to the father and the father has a total trust in the son and lets him do what he wants to. There are a number of scriptures that I would like to read about this co-ownership. First John 17 says, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, for they are yours. All mine is yours and yours is mine, and I'm glorified in them. And Jesus in that prayer talks about joint ownership. And then we come to 1 Corinthians 15, which is a prophetic scripture. It says, then comes the end when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom to the Father after destroying every rule and authority and power. So this victorious Jesus, after Satan is defeated, gives the kingdom to the Father. And then we see almost the opposite in Revelation uh, 11 15 when it says and then comes the end uh, where oh I didn't put it in there it says then comes the end when the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our God and of his Christ and then of course there's Revelation chapter 2 uh, 21 verse 1 to 2 when he says showed me the river of life clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the lamb and there they are on their throne together and so there are these times when this authority and wealth is transferred from the father wins it gives it to the the son wins it gives it to the father and the father gives it back to the son and it happens in various wonderful events in history the third thing we learn about christ who is more than you know is manifest glory the scripture says in verse three he is the radiance of the glory of god now, what is the glory of God? Well, first, his presence. Ezekiel 1 says, and I'd like to read this, Above the expanse over their head there was a likeness of a throne, and it appeared like sapphire, and seated above the likeness was a likeness of a human appearance. And upward from what was his waist I saw gleaming metal, and the appearance of fire all around, and downward was the appearance of fire and a brightness around him, like the appearance of a bow in the crowd in the day of rain. Wow, he's trying to describe what God looked like. Well, we think of the attributes of God, which are beautiful. And we think of the creation of God. And I just got a big picture of the creation of God when I drove through the mountains of Montana. It was just gorgeous, mile after mile after mile. And then I think of God's plan for salvation and eternity, and that too is glorious. But Jesus Christ himself is the diamond on the ring of God's glory. He is the radiance of the glory of God. 1 Timothy 6.16 says he dwells in unapproachable light, and he also dwells in our hearts. Yes, Jesus is more. He's more than you know because he is a mirror. He is the exact imprint of the nature of God. What is God like? We all humanly have a little bit different nature. We'll say he's a good-natured fellow or he's a rough-natured character. Well, first we think of God's nature and we think of his attributes, meaning his love and justice and holiness and peace and mercy and grace. But then we think of his dealing with Israel and the nations and how he dealt with them and often in grace. And then we get his commandments, the Big Ten. 
And all of this we get mostly from the Old Testament. And there are some conclusions that we draw. And one of the conclusions one would draw from reading the Old Testament was that God is a God of justice and a God of holiness. And some people get the idea that God is the great police officer in the sky. But don't forget Hosea, which is a, a story to show the love of God and the unfaithfulness of Israel. It is difficult to understand God from the Old Testament, though the love of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of God is present throughout the Old Testament, but the judgments of the Old Testament are so severe in the eyes of humanity that it's overwhelming to us. And people read the Old Testament and they often come away uh, missing the love of God, the grace, the mercy, and all of that, even though it's present because they're just so stunned by God's overwhelming judgment. But the message in this verse is that Jesus is the exact, exact imprint of the nature of God. So we also see the nature of God in the Gospels. We can learn attributes in theology, but we get a lot of it through the personal ministry of Christ how Jesus was so tender with the children, the lame, the sick, and the elderly, how he had compassion for the multitudes because of their spiritual problems and their hunger, the grace for the woman caught in adultery, and he said, go and sin no more. We see so much about God in Jesus because he's the exact imprint that we see in Christ the nature of God in the flesh. Well, there's more about Jesus here. It reminds me of the song, More About Jesus. He is the mainstay. And here's the text. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Note in verse 1, it says, Through him the world was created. Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our own image. He didn't say, I will make man in our own image, in my own image. He said, let us make man. It was him and Christ. And then we see in Colossians 1, 16, a similar verse that says, by him, all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authority. They were all created with him and through him. Now, I would like to speak about God's prophetic plan for mankind. We are now living in what we call the age of grace, where salvation is full and free, and that age ends, according to the Bible, with the rapture when the dead in Christ are caught away, only to be followed by the tribulation, a horrible time on earth, but a time when many Jews come to the Lord. And that is ended by two events. First, the return of Christ with his saints, and the Battle of Armageddon. And there are survivors to the Battle of Armageddon, and the nations are judged, and the millennial reign of Christ is set up, and after a thousand years is the final battle. And then comes the Great White Throne Judgment, and after the Great White Throne Judgment, John says in Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the earth had passed away. Here's what I want to say to you, is according to God in his word, is that man and the earth will survive the age of grace, the rapture, the tribulation, return of Christ, the battle of Armageddon, the millennium, the final battle, and the great white throne judgment, and it is the new heaven and earth where it all stops. Now, for the last 50 years or better, 
we have been inundated, actually it's more than 50, about 60, with human catastrophic predictions. When I was a child, Dr. Paul Ehrlich wrote his book, The Population Bomb, and if you read his book, you would think that we would be like the rabbit standing around the, rob the water holes in Australia when they had their big rabbit explosion. And you know what's interesting? Dr. Ehrlich is still alive and still promoting his idea that the population is unsustainable. Well, after Dr. Ehrlich kind of lost his thing, and I mean, they had to speak in every public school in the nation, we came into an era where we were warned about global cooling. And uh, it was going to get so cold out that we couldn't survive. And, of course, that was back when we had gas problems anyway and oil problems. We were all scared. How are we going to survive the winters up here? We might all have to move to Florida. And then when that ran out of gas, <laughs> they started global warming. And global warming in this day is something that permeates all politics, everything, and, you know, it is a governing a principle. And by the way, anybody who doesn't say yes and bow down to global warming is pretty much marginalized as an idiot in our world. So what am I saying to you? God has said that the earth and man will survive the rapture, the tribulation, the return of Christ, and the battle of Armageddon, the millennium, the great battle, and the great white throne judgment, and then will be the new heaven and new earth. And it is all in God's hand. So I say to you, who will you trust? God or the scientist? Now, the last thing I see in this scripture is with Jesus, mission accomplished. It says, after making purification for sin, he sat down on the right hand of salvation with a majesty on high. Two things in this text. Number one is salvation. That Christ went to the cross and took our sins and he defeated sin, Satan, and death. And that is our greatest adversary. He took our sins and put on his record, and he put our record on his sins. So we got righteousness, he got sins, died with those sins, and rose again. And then upon rising again, he went on to ascend into heaven and sit down at the right hand of God above every name and with all things at his feet. Mission accomplished. So what I want to start this whole thing in Hebrews is say to you that Jesus is more than you know, more than you know because he is God's message, he is majestic, he is the manifest glory of God. He is the exact image, the mirror of God. He upholds the universe, and he accomplished his mission. Now, I told you, Jesus is more than you know. I'm going to finish this sermon saying Jesus is not only more than you know, he's better than you know. So this whole sermon series starts with a Jesus who has accomplished more and done more than you can ever imagine. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for being our Savior. We want you with all our heart. Bless us, encourage us, and help us to trust Jesus in all things because he's more than we know. In Jesus' name, amen.